um, normally when we engage in you know tough conversations, I'm trying to prove you wrong or I'm trying to change your mind or do things like that. But when we come from this place of compassion, I'm really seeking to understand. If you ever feel tongue tied when a difficult conversation comes up or when discussions on race or religion or politics or something else emerges, this episode is for you. Now, Dr. Nancy Dome is back to Unleash Learning TV and with her new book, she's here to help you and me learn how to talk about race and other hard things with a framework that I believe will help us all become hard conversations superheroes. Welcome back to Unleashed Learning TV and big congratulations, Nancy, for your book. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> I'm really excited to talk to you. So as you may or may not know, uh, two of our core values at Unleashed Learning are mindful communication and equity and inclusion. So hello, let's talk about your book, right? So it's like your values and actions. So that's why I'm excited to talk to you. So um, what I want to ask you to jump into this, Nancy, is you've worked with thousands of educators and adults and people around equity, diversity, inclusion. Yeah. And I want to know, why is it so hard for us to talk about race? Yeah, you know, I think to start, I think one of the reasons why it's so difficult is that we've never addressed our racial history. And it is painful. And it seems to be this thinking that if we don't talk about it, it'll somehow go away. But those things don't disappear, you know? And so we, we really have to learn how to kind of step into that discomfort that we feel when talking about these things and, and engage so that we can get to a place of healing together. Um, so I, th I think that's probably my, my biggest reason why I think we don't talk about race. I also think that people just, our society has not really supported open dialogue around these things. I mean, the things that are most important to us are identities, um, you know, uh, politics and religion are things that we are like, we've been cautioned our whole lives not to talk about. And, and I think that in some ways it's a mistake and we're seeing that really um, present itself now that the things that we haven't been used to talking about, we now can't talk about them. That's really powerful. And also, uh, I should say also what I notice is you know, we talk about making learning stick for everyone. We have to pay attention to what we mean by everyone. And I'm hoping, yeah. well, I know your book's going to help people in those conversations of what we mean about everyone. So, um, well, let's jump into it. Because one of the things you do so well in the book is you offer a way into those conversations, right? Yeah. And you've got the RIR protocol. And I'm wondering if you can briefly tell us about the protocol. Because when I read your book, I thought, wow, Nancy, of course, is giving us a way in to have those conversations in an empowering kind of way. So can you tell us about the protocol, please? Yeah, absolutely. And I also just want to clarify that the protocol is for everything, right? I, I use Let's Talk About Race because that's been the focus of my work. But in the book, you'll notice that, you know, the examples we use are uh, really run the gamut of, you know, relationships and experiences within organizations. So um, I want us to think about it this way. So compassionate dialogue, which, which I would call the framework is the what, right? And the how is RIR protocol. And I say that because without compassion, the RIR is just another uh, way of communicating that can either be effective or ineffective, right? I, and so R is recognize, I is interrupt, and then the other R is repair. And I say that, you know, without compassion, I can recognize that my feelings are hurt. I can interrupt by telling you you're a jerk. And I can repair it by never speaking to you again, right? And so that kind of defeats the purpose. And so that's where the compassionate dialogue, the framework really comes in. It's this idea of, of it, it gives us our motivation. It tells us what we want to accomplish. And it also, through compassion, it shifts the way that we engage in these conversations. So um, normally when we engage in you know, tough conversations, I'm trying to prove you wrong, or I'm trying to change your mind, or do things like that. But when we come from this place of compassion, I'm really seeking to understand, right? I want to understand you. And it doesn't mean that at the end we're going to agree, um, but what it means is that I'm going to hear you. And then the invitation is that you also hear me, even if what I'm saying or vice versa is difficult, that we make space for that, for those difficult things to, to, to come up so that we can, you know, move forward with all the information. I love, you know, what I, makes me think about when we talk about mindful communication, because our team and the police people we work with, we talk about this all the time because it's woven through everything we do. And we're mm -hmm. always talking about what does that really mean? What does this really yeah. mean? And so you, what I heard you say was, 
Well, partly what it means is you go into it from a space of compassion, yeah. right? You go into it with intentionality and then you can use the protocol. It's not, it's not a power play. Right. It's a compassion dialogue, which I think is a really important part of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and in doing it that way, that's where we get to talk about vulnerability too, right? Is that there's an invitation that, um, that I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to be vulnerable. And I think it's counterintuitive, especially when you think of the things that do trigger us mm. where um, I'm triggered. And so it seems counterintuitive for me to then say, I'm going to be vulnerable with you, but it really is a place of power instead of a place of weakness for me to show up and say, wow, what you just said had an impact on me. Um, are you trying to hurt me? You know, are, and, and I can get to the, that interrupt from a place of really wanting to know the answer as opposed to the interrupt, which is usually like me just you know, doing a big old debate with you about why I'm right or why, why you're wrong. And so this idea of really being willing to show up and be vulnerable and take a risk and have asked the hard questions, but really being clear on what that why is, what that question is, so that you're asking the right questions. But um, I just think that, you know, you can't have compassion and defense in the same conversation. You, 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 if you're going to show up compassionately, it really means that you have to show up open. You got to know yourself a lot, too, because I would imagine as you're describing that, I'd have, I'd have to really know what I'm being triggered. I'd have to know how I react or respond. I'd have to. So when you're describing that makes me think I have to really know who I am as an educator or leader or as a human being to yes. go into those kinds of conversations. Yeah. I mean, and that's why the first star is recognized, right? Is it, It's not recognize what's happening externally. It's actually rec recognizing how what, hap what, what happened externally is impacting you how it is impacting you. So when I recognize something, I am recognizing first what's happening in my body. And then two, I'm naming it because your body knows first, your body always knows what's right, what's wrong. And it takes a minute for our intellect to kind of catch up and be able to name it. And so once I know my, the better I know myself, the better I can identify those, those kind of indicators in my body that are giving me a message. And then I can translate that message into language. And so I may recognize I have a feeling and I'm uncomfortable and I might turn that into, oh, I'm, I'm frustrated, you know, that, and, and what does it mean for me to be frustrated? So that's a, the, the final piece. It's not just enough to name it, but I have to know what it means for me to be frustrated so that I can mitigate that and be able to then enter the interrupt with compassion. It, I'm, I, you know, we were talking earlier, but um, partly the system, right, to make learning stick for everyone, there's the key of educator or teacher, depending on who we work with. And that's usually the hardest key to have a conversation about, because if you want to make learning stick for everybody, you have to know some stuff about yourself. Yeah. And you're describing that kind of deeper work because we teach who we are, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're describing that so well, another uh, reason 5,252, why I adore you so much. Um, so um, I, I do want to ask, because we, we've talked about vulnerability, but how do we be vulnerable in those conversations and those hard conversations without getting defensive? Yeah, it's, you know, for me, I, I always say it's practice. You know, um, it doesn't just happen. We, we have been conditioned. We have done things for many, many years a certain way. And so now there's an invitation to do it differently. And so I just have to practice and I got to show up. And I think that for me, the biggest thing that I learned in my practice was that I can be vulnerable and I am going to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what it comes down to. Because when you think about why we're not vulnerable, it's because we're trying to protect ourselves. Yeah. Well, if I don't need to, if I don't need to protect myself, if I don't feel like I'm in like physical danger or, you know, like serious emotional, you know, mental kind of abuse, abusive um, situation, then I can be vulnerable because I'm going to survive it. And I'm, I'm starting to train myself to understand that um, I have a higher tolerance for that discomfort now. So the things that used to kind of have me flying, you know, fleeting, are fleeing, pardon me, fleeing away are now things that, that when they show up in my body, I can stay, I can stay grounded. I can stay present. I can stay conscious really and participate. You know, my, I don't have a, my amygdala isn't hijacked and I'm not like taken out, you know, looking for the door and like, how do I get out of here? I can really 
really just lean into it and and know that the feeling will will pass and that I will survive this. And I think that that's probably you know the best thing we can do is just practice and just keep reminding at the other end of it. It's like okay, look, I'm okay. Okay, look, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, and hopefully the relationships are better because of it. So you begin to see a benefit too. It makes me think you it, almost the way you describe that, Nancy, is like you recognize it in your body, like, oh, there, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this is how I hear it. Like you recognize it again. So when that vulnerability comes up, you probably recognize it in your body. You're like, oh, there you are again. And it's not, yeah. it's not, um, it's almost like a returning visitor. It sounds kind of strange, but you're used to that the way you're describing it. So the more you yeah. get used to that and you're not caught up on maybe the moment of it, you're more, you're connected to yourself in a way. Yeah. So that's yeah. a way, if we want to be mindful in our communication, you keep talking about we've got to be connected to who we are yeah and we have and we have to identify and recognize those um those um identifiers in our body so like i think about an athlete and you know the it, it, when you go back to playing a sport they haven't played for a while you know what we all have in common is we're sore right <laughs> but eventually you you're not sore anymore you and you have and you you can keep going because you know that in a week from now you won't be sore from that because you've had that history so you know tough conversations are the one things that we actually don't really have and i'm making a, a pretty broad generalization here because plenty of people have tough conversations but in general we don't have that history to know that there is another way that there is an, another side that we will overcome that 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 barrier and make it to the other side and we'll be okay on the other side and so we have to just like we train ourselves to play sports or you know that in, enduring that discomfort uh we have to endure that discomfort in these conversations so that we can realize that okay I, i've been here before and i know this feeling and i'm going to be okay it probably also helps as i was reading your book and i'm thinking lots of people reading your book are thinking that way that also the vulnerability might dissipate a little bit if I have a framework to go into the conversation with. Mm -hmm. So I'm not yeah. in the forest alone. I'm actually going into the forest. If that's, I don't know how I feel about that analogy, but I'm going to use it. If I go in the, if I don't have a map to going into the journey, right? So you're giving us this tools yeah. to go in. So if I'm feeling vulnerable, I also, because that's how I felt reading the book. I thought, well, it's giving me a framework to, yeah. to go in. And so if I'm feeling vulnerable, at least I've got a toolkit to use it with intentionality, like you're talking. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, you know, probably the biggest challenge around people getting what you just said is that whenever we think about, you know, some kind of protocol or engaging, we always think that it has to have, um, you know, a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And that it's like, I had someone in my book study um, say, well, you know, I have a question. I, I just want to know, like, why would you say that? And she's like, but that's not compassionate. I'm like, what's, who says it isn't compassionate? Mm -hmm. Like you, you're the, the compassionate dialogue, the protocol is actually a framework for also self-care. It's a way for me to take care of myself. So if I'm able to articulate, you know, and, and ask you a question so that we can get to the bottom of it, then I'm also taking care of myself. And just because it says compassion doesn't mean that sometimes the questions aren't blunt. What we're trying to get away from is the accusation. You know, like that was a really stupid thing to say, or that, you know, you suck, or, you know, all the things that can come out because that will 100% shut down the conversation. What we're trying to do is get to a place of inquiry where I can ask a question. And depending on how I'm triggered, the question may come out maybe a little gruff, but it doesn't make it any less effective of a question because it's usually going to be an indicator of the dynamic that's already happening between us. And so mm -hmm. if I ask you a direct question and say, like, William, what does that mean? You know, and I can say it just, you saw my face kind of twist up and, you know, like, William, what does that mean? But that's still very different than me saying, William, that was stupid. You, you know, what I, you know, like it's a different feeling. So when I, when I ask you that question, even if my face is kind of, you know, messed up, you, you, you know that it's had an impact and, but you still get to answer it. Yeah. And so it also um, it makes me think about Nancy, like those conversations, like what's compassionate for you? What's yeah. it builds relationships because we have to check in about what I've noticed too. We've had lots of positive psychologists on the show talking about values. And what I've been noticing lately is 
sometimes when there's a conflict that I have with somebody, I don't mean conflict, but you know what? Sometimes actually yeah. what I realize is we have shared values, but we express them very differently. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so as you're describing compassionate dialogue, we might have similar values around that, but we might express that differently. And that's been really helpful to me because I go, oh, we actually have the same values. You just do it differently than I do. I do it differently than you. And that builds those kind of relationships. I think the way I'm describing, you're describing. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's, you know, I think what you just described is relationships, right? It's like, you know, you, whether it's a friendship or romantic or, you know, whatever you, you have, you're together because you have shared values, but, you know, we each have had enough conflict with people that we love and care for to know that the expression is is different and so how do you how do you bridge those you know that kind of gap there between the shared value and the way that we're communicating and i think one of the greatest things that i just learned as a teacher when i was in the classroom was someone told me you know this notion of separating the child from the behavior so you're angry at the behavior, not the child. And I think when we talk about compassionate dialogue, it's you know it's really separating the doer from the deed. So I, I'm going to adjust the deed. That that's what I can adjust. I'm not trying to you know tell you you're a horrible person. Now I may end up at that conclusion at the end. And yeah. and and I mean that's true. Yeah. Because you, know, you could. Yeah. There are horrible people in the world. Yeah. But I'm not going to start off just because you've uttered something that. I didn't like the way you uttered it. I'm not going to start off by saying you're a horrible person. So it's through that questioning too that I begin to understand who you are and and what that means to me and if I choose to continue to engage with you or not. But I, I'm 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 just taking it. You know, my girlfriend Debbie says she's like people quit five seconds before the miracle, wow. and what I don't want to do is quit five seconds before the miracle. So if I let you trigger me and I write you off. I may have been quitting a little too soon. I think one of the things that's helped, um, when I was reading your book, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, I didn't have that language, but I was thinking is sometimes things play itself out longer than it takes. Or I have to give it longer because in a year, you know, I've had met, met people that are like, I didn't really like you. It wasn't until I had the job <laughs> interview that I go, oh my gosh, I get what he was teaching, right? So it might be, or I, I had an interaction a year later, I go, oh wait, I understand it now. Yeah. So that miracle piece may not, we say learning doesn't always stick in real time. Yeah. So yeah. that's a way of thinking about yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We've got time for one last question that I think is really, okay. really important is in your book, you say resolution doesn't always equal forgiveness. Can you please end with that? Tell us about that. Absolutely. So the, the third uh, piece of the protocol is the repair, right? And whenever we think of repair, we think of fixing it, but we think of fixing it to like bringing it back to where it was, like so that it's functioning. But sometimes repair is divorce, right? Um, that is a form of repair. Repair simply means that we've come back around and, and we are re-engaging to one, either make sure that uh, the person who we're in or the, the issue that we're in dialogue with um, knows that we're good. So if you and I have a disagreement and we, you know, we do the protocol, it's compassion, it's lovely. If we don't actually bring it back together, then our minds will continue to play tricks on us. And instead of focusing on the positive things that came out of our discussion, our mind will focus on the discomfort. It, it, it focuses on the feeling because it's what it can get in touch with right away. And so for me to then leave it and not come back around and say, hey, William, you know, thanks for your time or we're, are we good? You know, something that lets us know that we, oh, what, we survived this, right? It's that proof that we survived and we can move on. But sometimes through the interrupt phase, um, I may determine in the interrupt that really your intention is malicious towards me. And um, so m the repair is that, you know, maybe we don't need to be in relationship anymore. Um, and so, uh, and, and I, and, you know, forgiveness, I, I don't know if it's right, forgiveness, because forgiveness is, is a little different than like the divorce. When I think about forgiveness, I think that I, I think that's really um, internal process, right? Um, it's it's less about you and more about me forgiving, not forgiving myself for whatever it is, right? And I think we get lost because people think about the the protocol and they're like, well, 
the person I need to do the protocol work with, you know, was my dad and he died, you know, so how do I do this? Well, because you, you can still That's get right. centered and grounded in your, in yourself, right? It's, it's forgiving you. And then, you know, possibly that forgiveness, but it's not, you know, when I think of forgiveness, it's not in the sense of, I forgive you and we're all good. I may forgive what you did. And, but it also may also still mean that I don't want anything to do with you. I always remember Carol LeMay said, you know, contracts end sometimes. Yeah, they contracts do. Contracts end sometimes. We get empowered. We've learned our lessons. Yeah. And then contracts yeah. end, and that's okay too. And so sometimes we want to hold on for dear life. And but contracts, you know, we learned the lessons. We got what we needed and, and that kind yeah. of stuff. So what do they say? They say season, no, reason, season, or and lifetime. Lifetime. Well, you've right. been a lifetime so far. Yeah, you've so been a keep... lifetime for me too. Know, so. So. And, it's, um, and it's knowing the difference and letting go when it's over. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I think the last piece about this, I'm thinking about our mindful communication is it's not, it's not this, it's this. It's like going inside out, right? So, okay, so this is what we're going to do. Um, you graciously gave us a couple copies of your book. So yeah, fantastic. And so what we're going to do, we always ask a question to the audience. So here's our question to the audience. I'm looking at you. We want to know, how do you engage compassionately with difficult conversations. So some of the best conversations take place after the episode. What we're gonna do, Nancy, is um, the team will decide who's the best comment. And then we will mail, uh, we have, I think we've got two copies of your book or maybe three. We'll mail those to the whoever they are in the world and let's get um, some great conversations happening on this planet right now. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much for the work you do, Nancy. You know, I'm a big fan. Oh, ditto, thank you blessings. Okay. Thanks everybody. We'll speak to you soon. We'll see you next time on Unleashed Learning TV. Bye everybody. So now it's your turn. We've got a question for you. We want to know what's your approach for talking about hard things. Now, some of the best conversations take place after the episode. So add your comments there and we're going to pick a few of the best comments and send you a free copy of Dr. Nancy Dome's book, wherever you are in the world. So join the conversation.